everyone. Uh, so we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to Mueller Field Station's virtual Speaking of Nature series, Spooky Edition. We're getting into the spirit of Halloween here. As you can tell, I'm very excited about that. So the title of our presentation tonight is Back to Our These Caped Crusaders, and our presenter is Shannon Dermody. My name is Ali Esposito, and I'm the Conservation Education Outreach Coordinator at Mueller Field Station. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Mueller Field Station, we're part of Finger Lakes Community College, and we are located in the Southern Honeyway Valley. Uh, Mueller is a great place that hosts a bunch of environmental education programs. Uh, we have K through 12 programs. We have Finger Lakes Community College conservation students come down here for courses and to conduct their own research. And we also have community events such as this. So if you could please uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram, you'll receive updates on what's going on at the field station. And you'll also uh, find announcements on our next Speaking of Nature events uh, that we're still working on for November, but there will be a presentation so um, another thing I want to mention is tonight we are doing a raffle. Uh, I'm going to choose one lucky attendee from our attendee list to win a prize, and I will announce them at the end of the presentation. So stick around for that. And at the end, we'll also be answering questions. So there's a question and answer box that you can find on the right hand uh, bottom corner of your screen, and I'll read the questions aloud, and Shannon will answer them. So, Shannon Dermody is one of my really good friends and co-workers. She is a technician specialist at Finger Lakes Community College in the Conservation Department. She has her bachelor's degree um, from SUNY Environmental Science and Forestry, and she has been studying that since 2016. She has contributed a lot of research about bats to various uh, government agencies, uh, academic institutions, and non-for-profit organizations. And she really loves bats. Uh, I've learned a lot about them from her. And she is uh, going to tell you so much about them tonight. So, Get your bat ears out. <laughs> so thank you for being here, Shannon. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to pass the baton to you. Uh, for unaware, uh, I'm going to be talking about bats this evening or all things bats. And we will jump right in. All right, just a quick overview for you guys. We'll be talking about how society and culture view bats. We will explore bats around the world and their ecology. I'll give you kind of the basics about echolocation, and we'll talk about essential roles bats play in our natural ecosystems. We'll talk about New York State bats and their threats. And I'll talk about research and kind of what it's like to be a bat biologist. And then we will talk about disease. Okay, so culture. Uh, so bats uh, have mostly a negative reputation in uh, many different cultures for hundreds of years. Uh, in Western culture, Bram Stoker's 1897 Gothic horror novel Dracula uh, had a really big influence on uh, the misperceptions and how bats are uh, so feared and uh, demonized in culture. I'm sure there's many people around the world who think uh, all bats want to bite you and uh, suck your blood. And it's really the cultural media, movies, books, and um, I think really the fear of the unknown that really drives these misperceptions. And bats are inconspicuous and historically not really taught in schools. And um, your average person doesn't really get a chance to see a, a bat up close, right? But in my opinion, I think they're making a good uh, cultural comeback. The uh, 1993 children's book, Stella Luna by Janelle Cannon, 
has been around for years, but for me personally, I had never heard of it until I think college maybe. And uh, it's just made a comeback, I think. It's more popular amongst children. And I uh, did some educational talks about this time last year for some kindergartners and first graders. And I was absolutely amazed how excited and enthusiastic these kids were about bats. I mean, they understood concepts like echolocation, which like for me personally, I'm still learning about. And they were just so excited. And it was really awesome to see that. And I think uh, bats are slowly being viewed in a more positive light in cultures. Okay, so how many species of bats are there? There are almost 1,400 species of bats in the world. They comprise of one fifth of all mammalian species. They are the second largest order and uh, rodentia or rodents uh, being the first. And they inhabit every continent except Antarctica. And bats form the largest aggregation of any mammals uh, except humans, obviously. And um, they have really complex social groups. And some scientists have compared those social groups to those of whales and dolphins and even other primates. Okay, so what's really astounding is bat diversity. There are so many different colors and shapes. I mean, look at this visored bat. It, it doesn't even look real to me. <laughs> Uh, male Chapin's free tail bat at the bottom there. They have this crazy crest of hair that actually um, disperses a scent from a gland at the at the base of the head. And the smallest bat we have in the world is the kitty's hog nose bat or the bumblebee bat. And as adults, they weigh uh, just two grams, and that is less than a penny. And they also happen to be the smallest mammal in the world. And then we have the golden crowned flying fox, which is one of the world's largest bat. And their wingspan is almost six feet. So just take a look at the different facial features of all these bats here and the different uh, body types and sizes. It's, it's really remarkable. Okay, so bats are of the order Chiroptera. Chiroptera actually means hand wing, and they are mammals, and so they are warm blooded. They uh, have uh, fur or hair, and they give birth to live young, and the young are actually called pups, and they secrete milk for their young, and they happen to be the only true flying mammal. So there are two suborders within the order Chiroptera. They used to be called uh, mega Chiroptera. So those are your big mega bats or your flying foxes. And then the micro Chiroptera, so those are the micro bats. Uh, those names have since changed because there's been uh, some more taxonomic studies on them. So now the um, the megabats are called the yin taro chiroptera, so it's uh, the megabats and some other families of bats, and the yango chiroptera, so those are your microbats. So there's um, morphological features always uh, serve a function, right? So the tube-lipped nectar bat at the top there, its tongue is one and a half times longer than its body and the skull is actually very narrow and long. And so when that bat uh, you know, approaches a flower, it can really get deep into that flower to access the nectar. And then we have the spectacled flying fox. And if you notice, the eyes are pretty large and the nostrils are very prominent. So you can suspect that this bat relies on sight and smell to find food. And then their ears are relatively small for their body size, right? So they're not really uh, relying on hearing or echolocation. Uh, these megabats or these flying foxes actually don't echolocate at all. And um, they don't really rely on hearing to find their food. And then that's versus the Raffinesque's big-eared bat. And by the name, you can tell their ears are ginormous. Um, you can tell that they're really good echolocators. 
And uh, the eyes are extremely small and their nose is uh, relatively simple. So they're not really relying on sight and smell to find their food. And then we have the wrinkle faced bat. So these guys have, you know, pretty, pretty prominent uh, ear or I'm sorry, uh, eyes. And they're, uh, they have these like crazy flaps and folds of skin on their faces. And scientists don't really know what the purpose that serves. Uh, they suspect maybe it helps funnel uh, fruit juice into the mouth or maybe even filters the juice somehow. We're really not sure. So there's a lot of different morphological features, as you saw. I wanted to show you kind of what a New York State bat would look like. So our New York State bats have pretty small eyes and simple noses, so they're not relying uh, solely on sight or smell to find their food. So they're all insectivorous, or they eat insects. So their ears are relatively large because they all echolocate. And all bats in the world have the same number of digits as we do and their digits or their finger bones are very elongated and they are all connected by a wing membrane except for the thumb, which is, uh, it's a free thumb and it's actually clawed as well. And you should recognize all these body parts, maybe except for the calcar. And that is really just a protrusion from the ankle bone and it just uh, helps with the maneuverability of the wing membrane or what we call a uh, uropatagium. And the wing membrane is actually uh, thinner than a plastic bag. Okay, so again, all mammals, or I'm sorry, all bats are mammals in the order Chiroptera. And then the bats we have here in New York State are in the family Vespertilionidae. And that is the uh, largest bat family within the 18 bat families. And I wanted to show you kind of a life cycle of a bat. So I chose the Eastern red bat, happens to be my favorite bat, or Lazarus borealis. So pups are born between May or June or late, or I'm sorry, early July. And they learn to fly about three to four weeks later and they are weaned from their mothers at five or six weeks. They will mate uh, between August and October, and they have a uh, delayed implantation of, the, of their egg or embryo, so they will give birth the next maternity se season or the next spring. So you can see here for red bats, I mean, most uh, bats have one pup uh, per year, but it does depend on each species. Red bats are really amazing because they on average have two to three pups at once and have been documented to have five pups at once. So this mother right here in the picture is actually nursing three at once and they are just extraordinary bats. They are not a big bat. They're pretty average in size and um, just the amount of weight they have to carry and fly with, especially if they have five pups, it's really amazing. And I've caught plenty of pregnant females and sometimes their belly is so enlarged that the skin is pretty much translucent. You can actually see the pups through, through the skin. And there's always this idea that the smaller the animal, the shorter the lifespan, but it's it's really not the case for bats. Uh, they are really programmed to live pretty long for their size, and it, it is different for each bat, but uh, the oldest bat recorded was at 41 years of age. Okay, so echolocation. Echolocation is the use of sound waves and echoes to determine where objects are in space. So they will call at very high frequencies and those calls will bounce off of their environment and then back to the bat where their ears are finely tuned to recognize their own call. And for me, I, I think the coolest part about echolocation in bats is that 
they're echolocating at very high decibels. Like think of a like a fire alarm. And to avoid going deaf by their own calls, there's this middle ear bone called, I'm sorry, middle ear muscle called the stapedius. And this muscle will contract and separate the inner ear bones. So essentially uh, decreasing the hearing sensitivity. So the bat is calling, their middle ear bones are disconnected. And once they're done with that call, that inner ear muscle uh, relaxes and the middle ear bones uh, come back together so the bat can then listen to the echo. And this all happens within milliseconds. It's really amazing. Okay, so sound is a pressure wave vibration of molecules, right? So I don't want to get too in the weeds about the physics of sound and echolocation, but I wanted to give you an idea of how we can tell species of bat based on a uh, echolocation recording. So the idea that shorter wavelengths produce higher frequencies. So in bats, uh, higher frequencies allow them to detect smaller objects. So it provides them a, a finer detail. Uh, the shortfall of that is that the frequencies or the sound doesn't travel very far. So a northern myotis is a relatively small bat. It produces, I'm sorry, it preys on small insects. And you can find them in very cluttered environments. So cluttered being uh, very highly vegetative um, canopies. So there's a lot of things that this bat can bump into, essentially. So they're echolocating at a base of 40 to 50 kilohertz. So that's pretty high. And they have to, they, to do that because they need that fine detail when they're um, navigating their landscape. So the longer wavelengths produce uh, lower frequencies. And uh, a good thing about this is that they travel further, but the downfall is they produce less detail. So hoary bats are a large bat. They feed on large insects and they're found in, they're found in open environments. So I've actually never caught a hoary bat because they're notoriously uh, difficult to, to catch because they actually fly above the canopy. And as they're doing that, they're echolocating at pretty low frequencies of 17 to 23 kilohertz. So we can actually sometimes hear them in the landscape. So they're echolocating at those um, you know, lower frequencies, so they don't need a lot of detail to you know, see where they're going. So humans hear up to 20 kilohertz, and that actually decreases as we get older. Bats have very broad hearing ranges and a uh, non-invasive way we can study bats is using acoustics. So we will deploy what's called a bat detector, and that detector will record bat calls throughout the night, and uh, that's with a, an ultrasonic microphone. And then we can take that data, it's in the form of a WAV file, and we can run it through software. And that software displays the calls as a sonogram or what's called a spectrogram. And that's what this picture video is. So this is the Wildlife Acoustics Kaleidoscope Pro software. And you can see the colors of each pulse of the bat is actually amplitude. Our x-axis is time and the y-axis is in kilohertz. So I'm going to play this recording. I took this actually at Mueller Field Station and it's of a big brown bat call and I'm gonna play it, it's gonna be a normal time. So this is what you would hear if you were present while the bats were uh, being recorded. Turn my mic up. Okay, so pretty quick, not much going on. You may hear like some kind of very high pitched piercing. Uh, let's see. I wanna go again. There we go. So this is the same recording. 
and it's just going to play at an eighth of the speed, so pretty slow. So it kind of sounds like a bird, right? <laughs> so what I want to show you here is uh, basically there's three phases within this pass. So each pulse in the beginning is relatively uh, spread out and it's pretty consistent, right? So this is called a search phase part of the call. And this tells us that the bat is you know, flying around looking for insects to eat. And then our second phase is what we call an approach phase. So we could see that the pulses become quicker because the bat is actually flying quicker. And uh, one pulse is made when the bat's wings come together and the pulses become steeper and higher in frequency because that bat is basically zeroing in on an insect and it needs finer detail, right? And then we have our last phase, we call it a feeding buzz. And that's like right when the bat catches that insect. That's the that's the sound they're making. So just by this, you know, short clip, uh, we can get a lot of data on behavior of bats uh, just by a recording. All right, diets. So you can find many feeding strategies and diets in bats. Um, most bats are insectivorous. There's uh, fruit eating bats, uh, nectar and pollen eating bats. The fringe lipped bat can actually identify species of frog by their calls, and they can even avoid toxic species. The greater bulldog bat is a fishing specialist, and they have these really large, long-toed uh, feet that actually rake through the water's surface. And we have the pallid bat, which specializes in preying on uh, scorpions, and they're actually unaffected by their stings. And out of 1,400 species of bats, there are only three species that are true vampire bats, and they uh, survive exclusively on drinking blood. Okay, our beneficial bats. So there are so many foods that we eat every day that a bat plays some kind of role in its survival. So they are pollinators of 250 genera of flowering plants. Uh, when feeding, they disperse pollen. So it's those bats that really get into those flowers and they're essentially showered in pollen and they will uh, disperse that from flower to flower. They will actually defecate mid-flight between day roosts and feeding grounds and uh, that makes them one of the most effective long distance dispersers of tropical seeds. And you can see this Gambian epauleted fruit bat and he's uh, carrying out a fig uh, fig, a fig fruit, and who knows how far away that that fig uh, seed will end up. And they are the best uh, pest controllers. Uh, the availability of a lot of our foods we love is a product of the efficiency of insectivores eating pests. So pests like the codling moth that actually feeds on walnuts and the corn earworm moth. And without bats controlling pest populations, cacao bean yields, yes, that's chocolate, uh, would fall 22%. And insectivores, uh, or I'm sorry, insectivorous bats, uh, save the US between $3.7 and $53 billion each year. So I think you can maybe say thanks or think about bats when you're making like your charcuterie boards and eating your Halloween candy uh, later next week. Okay, you can also thank them for the margarita. 
So the lesser long-nosed bat and the Mexican long-nosed bat are the primary pollinator of the blue agave, which happens to be the plant that tequila is exclusively produced from. The blue agave only blooms once in its life and then it dies. So before then, uh, the agave plant is storing up lots of sugars. The agave farmers uh, harvest the agave plant just right before it blooms, so they get that like maximum sugar content. And by doing this, they're actually eliminating a major food source for these two bat species. And they're also eliminating, eliminating the pollination process. So pollination uh, creates uh, new plants and it also increases bio, I'm sorry, uh, genetic diversity. So farmers get around this by planting hundreds of hectares of agave clones. So this practice really leaves these agave fields susceptible to lots of diseases. And in 1999, farmers lost uh, more than $200 million because of a disease called TMA. And it, I think it wiped out like a quarter of the agave crop. So Dr. Rodrigo, I'm gonna say this right, Medellin from University of Mexico, teamed up with the Tequila Interchange Project, and they convinced producers and farmers to essentially let a small percentage of their agave crop to bloom. So I think it's 5% of their agave crop. And this provides, this will provide food for the bats and the opportunity to increase genetic diversity through pollination. So the lesser long-nosed bat and the Mexican long-nosed bat are still endangered in the U.S. and Mexico, but they have seen populations rise due to this partnership. And you can see here the, there's the uh, bat-friendly tequila sticker. So if there's any tequila uh, connoisseurs out there, you guys can look for that sticker. Okay, on to our New York State bat species. We have nine species of bats in New York State. Three of them are migratory tree species. So we have the Eastern red bat, who we've met, the hoary bat, and the silver-haired bat. So your reds and your hoaries are going to actually roost among the foliage of, excuse me, usually deciduous trees. And then our silver-haired bats are actually going to roost uh, in tree crevices, uh, underneath bark, sometimes in buildings. And instead of hibernating up north in a hibernacula, they will actually migrate south for the winter, kind of like a bird. And after that, we're, we're not sure what happens to them. There's really uh, limited data on them. Okay, on to our local cave bats. There are six species. We have the big brown bat the little brown bat, northern long-eared, the eastern small-footed bat, Indiana bat, and the tricolored bat, formerly known as the eastern pipistrelle. And so for the northern long-eared bat, which is the bat I studied, they have been federally listed as threatened since 2015 from uh, white nose syndrome, which we'll get into. And then the Indi Indiana bat has been listed as endangered since 1967 and that was due to uh, roost disturbance. So these are the bats. They, they will roost in tree crevices, uh, underneath bark and rock crevices, under bridges. And these are the bats you're gonna find in your house and other anthropogenic structures. And it's about this time of year, they will start migrating toward uh, abandoned mines and caves, and they will hibernate throughout the winter months and then emerge about mid-April. Okay, threats to our local species. So the biggest threat for our tree bats are actually wind turbines. So scientists believe it is a combination of the physical trauma from the spinning blades, but also uh, what's called barotrauma, which is the damage of tissues due to a rapid change of air pressure. So they're essentially getting the bends and tens to hundreds of thousands of tree bats die and die each year in the US alone. And there's lots of studies being done to decrease these fatalities, 
there's uh, there was a recent paper published where I think scientists uh, painted one of the blades black, and this decreased avian or bird fatalities by like 70 percent. Um, I don't think it had an impact on bats, um, but uh, there's there's lots of studies being done to mitigate these fatalities, and there there also used to be uh, many. Uh, job opportunities for technicians, and they would do what's called a carcass survey. So you would walk transects uh, underneath all these windmills, and you would count and identify bird and bat species that have perished. I have never personally done it, and I've heard it's not the most um, exciting or pleasant job, but you know it's a good foot in the door if you're interested in bats and birds. Okay, white nose syndrome. So white nose is probably the most well-known threat to the bats in North America. White nose syndrome is caused by a fungal disease, which is the uh, fungus Pseudogymnoascus destructans, or PD for short, and it affects our hibernating bats or cave bats. Uh, our tree bats do not get sick from this disease, but they have been shown to carry the spores of the fungus, and it grows in cold and damp environments. It was first found in a cave outside of Albany in 2006, and uh, since then, this disease has killed more than 5.5 million cave bats in the U.S. and Canada. In some areas, it's uh, 90, 90 to 100 percent of bats have died. Uh, the worst hit by this fungus is the northern long-eared bat, which hence their listing, the uh, little brown bat, and the tricolored bats. So this fungus grows on the tissues of bats. You can see the left picture of the little brown bat, and there's something in that process that wakes the bat up and it starts to fly around, it will maybe uh, exit the hibernacula into those like really cold winter months. And this activity, the spike in activity, actually uh, burns up their fat reserves and the bat will essentially die of starvation. So when we process bats, we have to assess uh, white nose syndrome damage on the tissues. So we have to look at uh, at the wings, and we actually use a, a toy light up like drawboard to look at the look at the wings, and it works really well. But that's this middle picture here, and we have to give it a wing score of zero to three, zero being no damage at all, and three being like very necrotic tissue. Uh, usually, there's like no wing membrane left at all. Uh, you can see there's a lot of depigmentation in this wing or splotching, and there's no uh, necrotic tissue or holes, so it's probably a score of a one. And after every project we have, we have to decontaminate all of our gear, and that's because the fungal spores can persist on, you know, on your clothing, on your boots, uh, any gear you have. So we have to do that between every project as to not spread the disease. Okay, so here is the most up-to-date map of white nose spread. Uh, again, it's a cold-loving fungus, so it's very concentrated in the Northeast. It's also skipped the Rockies into Washington and Northern California. And uh, we currently do not know how this fungus got to North America. It is suspected that an infected bat from Europe came over on a shipping container. Biologists have found this fungus on European and Asian bats, uh, but they don't seem to suffer from the disease uh, like our bats do. Uh, there's very recent evidence that uh, maybe the little brown bat populations uh, may be bouncing back and they might be developing genetic resistance to this fungus. Uh, but we'll have to see. Okay, threats worldwide. Uh, so, bats all over the world are facing uh, major threats uh, common to other animals. 
There's extreme weather events like catastrophic heat waves in Australia. You may have heard about this. They have decimated populations of flying foxes, so much so to the point where they're essentially being cooked alive in their, while they're roosting. And bats that inhabit islands are really susceptible to uh, major hurricane events, uh, drought, and migration and phenology mismatch. So, for example, if there is a major drought occurrence that changes when, you know, a big population of insects emerge, that can have a real negative impact um, on bat populations and also their behavior. There's also bat, or I'm sorry, habitat destruction. So uh, deforestation is a very real problem in South America. Um, there's a lot of uh, logging being done for the cattle industry or the beef industry, and that's to uh, create cattle pastures. Uh, the you know forest fires in the Amazon, which is pretty recent, we all know about them, has decimated uh, roost habitat for bats. And also persecution, there's been many testimonies of people uh, burning bats alive in caves because they thought the bats might move into their house. So it's a lot of harmful myths, uh, misplaced fears, also hunting for consumption and uh, folk medicine. Okay, bat research. So uh, being a bat biologist can be very mentally taxing. Uh, you could be up, you know, two to three in the morning, seven days a week, and uh, up all day uh, tracking a bat or uh, taking care of bat detectors. To handle bats, you do need what's called a pre-exposure uh, rabies vaccination. That vaccine is, I believe, $900. <laughs> so if you do want to get into the bat world, um, always try to make sure your employer will pay for that vaccine. And to catch bats, we actually place these big, what's what's called a mist net, so that's M-I-S-T net, uh, over corridors, so such as trails or roads or even cave openings. And you net for typically five hours after sunset, and you check your nets every 10 minutes. So if you catch your target species, you can put a transmitter on them. So that's that upper middle picture. And the transmitter is affixed to the back of the bat between the shoulder blades. And we use non-toxic surgical glue. And that uh, transmitter actually emits essentially what's, it's its own uh, radio signal essentially. So uh, it will emit that signal and it allow us to find where that where that bat is going and where it's roosting or sleeping during the day. So that transmitter is very tiny. It has to be tiny because it cannot affect the flight of the bat. So a tiny transmitter means a tiny battery. So these things only last on average 21 days. And the picture on the right is a biologist I worked with and she's holding up a, a big antenna and a receiver that's dialed into that radio signal. So she's trying to find where on that tree the bat is roosting. So lots of different bat species have uh, different personalities. Uh, the picture to the left is, or to the right, is of a big brown bat, and they are notoriously chatty and kind of constantly bite you as you're holding them. And that's versus like an Eastern red bat. Those guys are pretty chill. Uh, sometimes they'll just lay in your hand and they're, they're just a quiet bat. And you get to see a lot of really cool uh, wildlife at night. We would always have uh, cute flying squirrels come to our nests, although they were, I, I'm not a fan of them. Uh, they would love to climb all over your poles and they love to get into the nets and just chew them up essentially. They can destroy hundreds of dollars of nets like within minutes. And I think it's engraved in my mind of what a flying squirrel sounds like, like their calls. I've had to run to my nets to scare them away just so many times. 
Okay, so I wanted to show you pictures of what the nets and the poles look like. So all of these uh, poles here are made by bat conservation and management. They come in these giant red bags and they're just really easy to set up. Uh, one person can put up a triple high, no problem. And when it's in a triple high, so or uh, that would be three nets stacked on top of each other. Uh, I, I believe they get up to 24 feet high and it's all uh, connected on a pulley system. So if you have a bat that's uh, in your net and it's 15 feet high above your, you know, above the ground, you have to uh, essentially lower, there's, lower those nets using a pulley system and you can get that bat uh, about chest height so you can untangle them out of the net. And we also have what's called a harp trap. So harp trap, you can see my cursor, it's one of these guys. So there's twine or a uh, fishing lure that is connected and it's um, uh, really tight up and down. And there's two layers of that. So the bat will fly into that and then essentially just drop down into a bag at the bottom. And then this upper left picture I included because this uh, biologist had the there's fortunate enough to use an ATV to carry her poles, but I never had the uh, the opportunity. Usually had to hook it. Okay, so usually I try to get a really great uh, slow motion action video of a bat release. This is my mentor releasing a big brown bat, and I just want to. Uh, say she's holding the bat in a very safe way. So when you are done processing a bat, you have to release them, right? So she has to lift her hand up really high so the bat has good clearance to take off. And she's not holding it in a way that's going to harm the bat. Uh, she's not pinching any tail bones or leg bones. And she's actually pinching that uropatagium or the tail membrane. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> so if you noticed, uh, the bat was super chatty. I mean, he's being held by a human, so he's pretty angry about it. And if you notice that uh, chatter becomes more faint and eventually disappears. So that's the bat basically realizing that, oh, I can fly away. And so he starts to echolocate, right? So he's echolocating at frequencies that we can't hear. And he's just trying to see what's the best you know, path of, of escape, essentially. There we go. All right, so in the midst of a pandemic, I apologize in advance. Uh, you probably thought you'd take like a nice evening to relax, maybe learn about some cool animals without thinking about COVID for once. Um, but I, don't worry, there's only one slide. <laughs> So I don't think it's any big news to you all that the current novel coronavirus may have originated in bats. Scientists uh, presume the virus SARS-CoV-2 that causes the disease COVID-19 may have originated from a family of bats in China called rhinolophus or horseshoe bats. And this is based on genetic testing. Uh, we may never know how this virus spilled into the human population, but we do know for certain is that a bat did not directly give, uh, a, give a human this virus. Uh, there is evidence that there is an intermediate host at play. Uh, some research suggests that a pangolin was that middle host uh, before entering the human population which kind of makes sense. Pangolins are one of the most trafficked animals and uh, research has found uh, 
that bats really host many, like hundreds of beta coronaviruses, which is a family of virus, uh, but they don't die or really get sick. So why do bats have this like super immunity? Recent research was done on bat cells where they reinfected them with the MERS coronavirus or the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. And they did this for months. And instead of killing the bat cells, the, the virus enters into this long-term relationship with the host. Uh, the virus adapts while the bat cells maintain its natural antiviral response, which doesn't happen in other species, especially us. So when you increase stressors on bats like wet markets and habitat destruction and encroachment, it disrupts that immune system virus balance and it allows that virus to multiply, therefore maybe increasing spillover events like this. So I think it's very important to understand how this occurs because we are already seeing scapegoating of bats and blaming them for this pandemic, but it's really a result of how we treat wildlife and our natural resources. Okay, so what you can do for the bats, you can spread the good word, uh, tell your friends and family how fascinating and really beneficial bats are to our, eco our natural ecosystems. You can build a bat box. Uh, bat Conservation International has great resources on their website. They can tell you um, what to make your bat box out of, how high they should be, what color they should be, uh, depending on where you're going to put it. Um, each region has a different color. So for our region in New York, uh, we would be um, painting our bat boxes black or a dark green because they, they really like it smoking hot in there. And participate in bat ecotourism. There's a famous bat colony of Mexican free-tailed bats in Austin, Texas, and they're actually roosting under the Congress Street Bridge. And it's been a long-term um, uh, you know, tourism activity to go and watch these bats emerge. And um, it's really quite the sight. I've, it's my goal to get there, but I've seen videos of it. It's really, it's really cool. And you can buy some tequila or, um, you know, purchase other wildlife safe products. And you can vote, you can vote for people who are going to take initiatives in helping preserve our natural resources. And that's not just for bats, that's for uh, all, all species really. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna say thank you so much for tuning in. If you uh, tuned in tonight with kind of a negative feeling towards bats, I hope you, um, you know, have changed your tune, I guess, and uh, find them as fascinating as I do. And I hope you um, look into, you know, more facts and research about them. So thanks for tuning in. I think I will take question and comments and there is my email as well, if you need that. Let me figure out how to get out of here. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. That was awesome. I think before we take questions, I'm going to announce our lucky winner. So give me one sec. I'll stop sharing. So might be. Making sure that person is still here. Yes. Okay. So Ju Julie Lewis, you won. A. <laughs> you want a t-shirt? Spotted salamander. It says Mueller Field Station on it. So I'll get your contact information after. And now I'll take some questions. So there were a few in the chat box. Okay. 
In New York State, what do various bats eat? Okay. So they definitely eat mosquitoes, which is great. Um, they, you know, the corn earworm moth. So corn is like a big crop in uh, New York State. And um, I'm sure there's so much info on it. And uh, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but you know, all bats here uh, are insectivorous. So they're definitely eating those mosquitoes and um, lots of other like beetle pests. And oh, I believe they also feed on the invasive lantern fly. So I know it's more of a big deal down in Pennsylvania, but it can it's probably going to get here eventually. Okay. Uh, how long does the glue keep the transmitter on the back? That's a good question. Um, it usually stays on pretty well. If you mean the transmitter, how well it keeps the transmitter on, um, the northern long-eared bats actually are notorious for taking that thumb claw and just like peeling that sucker off. Um, so yeah, it's always a disappointment when that happens. Um, but again, it's non-toxic. Uh, usually their hair, their hair will grow back. And I believe with, you know, rain and, um, you know, over time it, it does come off. I've I've recaught bats that we put a transmitter on and the, the glue isn't on their backs or their backs anymore. So Okay. Uh one second, sorry. Oh, can bats echo locate at different frequencies or only one frequency per bat species? So can I yeah, I think they're asking if you understand that question because it's a little part, a little confusing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So we can so there's kind of different groups of bats. So there's like your myotis bats. Um, those are smaller bats, so they tend to echolocate at 40 kilohertz and above. And then you have your big browns and your uh, hoary bats that are in that lower range. But there's always um, it's like like a characteristic frequency, and uh, we use that characteristic frequency to um, figure out what kind of species we're looking at. And uh, I believe the our northern long-eared bat is the highest. Um, they get to like that highest upper range. And I think it's uh, 120 kilohertz. So I hope that answers your question. Echolocation acoustics is just really fascinating. Can bats take off from the ground? They can. Uh, it can be difficult for them. And um, so for your like vampire bats, if you look at their wing structure and their body type, they, they're just really good walkers. So those guys are really, uh, they can take off from the ground really easily, but they can. It's, it's difficult for them, so we tend to, you know, if a bat does drop on the ground, we'll pick them up and, you know, give them give them a good clearance to fly away. There are a lot of positive comments on this. You've created some bat fans. Um, how prevalent is rabies in bats in New York State? I'm not quite sure about in New York State specifically. Um, there's lots of different percentages that people will say. Some people say it's you know prevalent in five percent of bats or 0.5. I I didn't touch on rabies at all. It's um there's just a lot of misinformation out there. I've if you look at uh, people or bat biologists like uh, Merlin Tuttle. He's been studying bats for like 40 years and has been so close with them and has never gotten rabies or has never been bitten by a bat that wasn't defending itself, right? So if he's holding a bat, we're always kind of getting bitten. Um, that's not to say that you shouldn't take rabies seriously, but it is a very lucrative vaccine. And 
um, it should be taken seriously. And uh, I'm not sure about percentages, but it's a very small percentage of um, rabies in, in bat populations. But yeah, I want to preface, uh, never pick up a bat. <laughs> if you do find a bat uh, on the ground or in your house, um, if you do decide to move it somewhere, please wear gloves. And the, it's the best way to just use a towel. And you just don't want to have that skin on skin contact. OK. What happens to humans if they get the white nose syndrome? Have you ever been severely bitten by a bat? So humans are not affected by white nose syndrome. Is, is that, was that their question? Yeah, um, I mean, that we know of. Uh, there hasn't been any issues with that. No, no bat biologist has um, had any uh, symptoms of white nose disease. So usually when we're holding bats, uh, that white fuzziness, you don't see that on the bat. You just, um, not that it's not there, the spores are on the bat, but uh, that, I guess it would be the fruiting body of the fungus. You don't see that during the summer months. So you really just see that fungus uh, growing on hibernating bats. And I have been bitten by a bat. Seriously, um, so you you know you get your pre-vaccination, pre-exposure vaccination, and uh, you get what's called a titer check every season. So it just measures the antibodies in your blood. And my body, for some reason, just doesn't um, hold on to those antibodies. So uh, I knew that my levels were very low one season and I had a big brown bat that just wouldn't let go of my finger and he bit through my latex glove through my batting glove and just made like a small little hole in my finger so I had to go get a booster shot so that's only that's my only story really <laughs> but you still love them or and you still love them um okay let's see What's the best way to get a bat out of a house? It's a very common and very good question. Um, you can just open a door, open your windows. The worst thing you can do is uh, turn off the lights or uh, immediately leave your, your house. And that's because there are small animals, so uh, you, you'll never know where that bat went. <laughs> uh, so the best thing to do is um, give them an exit. And uh, usually at night, they will leave the building and go forage for food at night. Um, I have heard cases where the bat just won't leave. Um, at that point, you can uh, call your local DEC office, and they can um, kind of instruct you on what to do and maybe even send someone out for you. But um, again, never pick up a bat, please. OK. Um, are the variation and variations in a bat's head, in parentheses, their appearance functional? Uh, is there an example? Uh, I don't know. I think they're asking if, like, the the way that their head is shaped, sir, like, they're all shaped pretty differently if they serve specific okay. functions. Oh, for okay. sure. Yeah. Um, I think I mentioned one nectar-eating bat, so their heads are like very narrow and long, and that's just to essentially aid them into accessing the nectar of flowers. And uh, I believe I had a picture of a hammer-headed bat, and that was of a male hammer-headed bat. And that's really just like a sexual uh, evolution. Um, you know, the more, uh, I guess, masculine or uh, 
you know, alpha bats of hammerheaded bats will have that like giant snout, essentially. You can Google them, they're crazy looking. But yeah, of course. So. Okay, we're gonna keep going if that's okay with you. Okay. Um, do bats fly differently than birds? Yes, they definitely do. There's a lot of aerodynamics going on. Um, I think I did mention that every uh, call is when the bats, I guess, when, they're, when their wings come together, right? And um, it's a lot of shoulder muscles and back muscles that are being used. And for a bird, they have um, these big chest muscles. And so it's more of the back muscles and shoulder muscles are working when a bat is flying versus uh, a bird is using most of their uh, chest muscles to fly. Okay. Um, maybe I missed this, but are you doing bat research at Bueller Field Station and our sister field station at the East Hill campus? I have uh, over the summer I had a bat detector at East Hill campus um, and then I did a few weeks it was probably a month I had the detector at Mueller Field Station and we got lots of species uh, we got some myotis bats so uh, I believe maybe little brown bats uh, myotis bats are hard to myotis is the genus and they're kind of hard to uh, decipher, you know, what species they are. So usually we kind of lump them together. So there, there were high frequency calling bats there and a lot of big brown bats, I think some horries as well. So pretty good diversity. Okay. How small do holes have to be for bats to sneak into your house? It happened to me in August. The common occurrence. So a bat can fit in a hole the width of your pinky. So extremely small. And uh, if you really need to, um, you know, uh, keep them from entering like any kind of building, you really do have to do a thorough search. And sometimes your attic is just like the perfect of micro habitat for them. So they'll they'll keep coming back. Okay, and I'm gonna read one more question. Um, could you share any volunteer opportunities? I would love to get involved. Uh, you mentioned working with wind turbines, any idea on who I can get in touch with? I think, uh, yeah, there's lots of uh, volunteer opportunities. There's uh, lots of jobs. I haven't uh, looked up many jobs recently, but for me, when I got out of college, um, Texas A&M is an amazing resource for uh, uh, recent graduates or students who want in to get into wildlife work. And there's a lot of, um, consulting firms that do those carcass surveys. And at the moment, because of COVID, we actually cannot handle bats because uh, we just don't know if there's any risk of a human um, spillover into our uh, native bat populations here. So they're really not taking that risk. I think there's a rapid research assessment being done uh, specifically on that, but uh, this summer was actually the first summer I never or I haven't held a bat and um, it's really unfortunate, but it is the the safe route to go. Um, but yeah, Texas A&M for jobs and I believe there's volunteer opportunities there. And in terms of local stuff, uh, there's not much to do during the winter time because all our bats are hibernating or have gone south for the winter, but uh, definitely look on our social media pages uh, during the summer months. And Shannon, there's one more question that's pretty interesting, so I'm going to read it to you. I recently listened to a podcast with Merlin Tuttle, and he mentioned something about bats potentially being closely related to primates because of their hand 
mammals? Are they related? And what other mammals are bats closely related to? Okay, if you're talking about the ologies episode, I think everyone should look into that. Um, yeah, I, that episode, the bat episode is really amazing. And I know exactly what you're talking about. So it wasn't the uh, the, the hand wings. It was actually, there's, um, I'm trying to say this correctly. There was like neural connections in the brain that um, researchers claim are diagnostic to primates and it's kind of an old idea and um, there was a biologist who claimed that uh, bats have this same neural connection that primates do and so he's made the claim that bats are actually more related to primates and should be classified as primates so I think that's super fascinating. They aren't currently classified as primates, um, but it's really interesting to think about. And um, it's it's interesting just to think about how like they're very long lived. They have social groups very similar to ours and um, can aggregate in these giant groups. And yeah, so it's that neural pathway um, you can Google it or really re-listen to that episode. It was really interesting. Um, yeah, but maybe one day they'll, they'll classify them as primates. <laughs> oh, and they're most closely related to, I believe, or they think maybe lemurs, but I could be wrong. I mean, they're close, they're more closely related to us than they are of mice. And usually they get that name, um, like flying mice. Okay, I think that's pretty much all of the questions. I tried to navigate between chat and the Q&A box. So thank you so much, Shannon. Um, it was really awesome. And for those of you who wanna come back to this presentation, we'll post it on Facebook. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope to see you at the next Speaking of Nature. Have a good night. Thanks, guys.